whatever the reason, we often overlook our own obvious strengths, uh, dismissing the very things that are central to us. Um, consequently, we write around the edges of our lives or our characters' lives so that our stories are pale imitations of what they could be. Um, they may be well written, they may even be entertaining, but they lack heart. As a writing teacher, I spend a good bit of my time helping students recognize and appreciate their own writerly landscapes. When a writer makes the shift to writing about a world he knows, embodied with places and characters that matter to him, the writing almost always comes alive. Um, so that's the gist of it, is that, I, I'm gonna close these doors. Um, for me, as our teaching of writing, I found that I spent a lot of my time trying to get to know my students, to get to know like where they're from, places they know really well, um, and what is central to them. Uh, because lots of times I find that people aren't writing about the very things that are obvious that they should be writing about, that places they um, know, uh, experiences they've had, work they've had, all these things that we all have, but we don't know ourselves in that way. We take ourselves for granted. We take our experiences for granted. Last night I talked a little bit about how I often have students who write about, who set their stories in New York City. But I mean, you know, they're from Asheville, or they're from like, you know, they're from Waynesville, they're from Goldsboro, they're from Pine Level. They're just from these places. But they feel like, well, everything they see on TV is in New York or whatever, and so they'll set their story in New York. And there might be the Statue of Liberty in it, I don't know. <laughs> um, but they've never been to New York. They don't know anything about New York. So all I'm saying, I mean, my big argument here is that, that, that we should look closely at our lives to see what we know. Um, it's almost like you have to stand outside of yourself and look and see, all right, well, you know, I did, my work was this for 20 years, and I know this in and out yet I've never written about it, I've never, ha never had a character who did this, or I lived in, I don't know, I lived in um, Pine Level for 40 years, and nobody's written about it, and why not? You know, so that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Um, but in this class, what I'd like to do is, is look at some specific things that I've noticed um, as far as what people are, reasons why people avoid their material. Um, so what I like, I see you all got out a piece of paper. So what I'd like you to do is um, take a minute and just uh, list some of the reasons that you're not writing about something that you have thought about writing about. And as you're doing that, write the thing and list the thing that it is that you want to write about.
Or maybe you've written everything you want to write about, and I'm not sure I can help you. <laughs> you don't need my help. Okay. Um, would anybody be willing to share? Probably not. <laughs> you would. All right. I have a dilemma with if you write about things that you know about, it sometimes includes your family members. Yeah. And they would be very offended. There you go. Okay. <laughs> what else? Well, I've got, um, let's see. It would be too dull, too personal, controversial, yeah. hurtful to people that I know, and routine has been done before. Okay. That covers a lot of them. That's good. Anybody else? Yeah. I put, um, I'm not qualified. I'm not an expert. I've not been validated. Um, fear of failure, not being good enough. And um, I like to write nonfiction motivation and sci-fi fiction. Yeah. Okay. Good. Anybody else have any? All right, well, those are all good and very illustrative of what I want to talk about. Um, so I'm going to go over, uh, first I'm going to go over just some things that I've noticed as I've dealt with people, with students. And then I'm going to give you a few examples of people I've worked with. Um, you know, it occurs to me, it's like one of those things where it's like, you know, the person before they lost weight and then after they lost weight. I, I, that image just occurred to me, I'm sorry. But anyway, so um, one thing is too painful. Um, it feels like, you know, it's too painful. We're gonna hurt um, people around us. Um, it, and it, it's too painful just to write about. Um, uh, maybe it was a period of our lives that we just soon forget about. Maybe you served in a war. Maybe you had a nightmarish experience in school somewhere along the way. Maybe you were divorced. Maybe you had an illness yourself. And the idea of revisiting this with all the pain and misery that it brings feels absolutely overwhelming. So we end up totally avoiding the subject or anything closely related to it. And I think that, I mean, it's good for you to know what you don't want to write about, because you're going to write about it. Um, and here's an example. I had a student, uh, her name is Ashley, and um, Ashley was a student of mine a few semesters ago, and she was writing some well-written, funny stories. They were fairly well-written. They seemed unfocused and just sort of all over the place. Um, but in class one day, she talked about having served in Army intelligence. This just came out of the blue, you know. And, um, and I do what I always do. I said, so have you written about it? And she said, no. She said uh, that she'd never written about it, that that time in her life had been um, not a nice time, is what she said. That she didn't like thinking about it and didn't like the idea of writing about it. In fact, she actively had avoided writing about it. Um, I told her she should think about writing about it, uh, that here was a big experience she'd had that nobody I know had had, and why not write about it? Also, it seemed very timely with Iraq and Afghanistan, and she said it was an awful hard time and she didn't want to write about it, and it was very emotional. She didn't want to dredge all that up. And I kept after her, asking her every now and then to think about writing about it. I just sort of uh, am obnoxious that way. <laughs> and so finally, she decided that she'd write one story out of her experience in intelligence training. And it was set in California, where she was. Uh, she'd never served out of the country. Anyway, she wrote, this was the best story she had written by far. Um, it was funny, and it was poignant, and full of great tension. And there were real sparks going off in this story that hadn't been going off in her stories before. Um, she could feel how good it was. She could feel it. Um, and decided that for the rest of her time in the MFA program I was working in, that she would devote 
uh, writing stories that grew out of that time. So she went from dreading writing about it to loving writing about it. And these were stories. They weren't um, creative nonfiction. They weren't memoir. They were stories. They were fiction, but based on her own experiences. So um, she made up things, but they were still full of authority. You could just tell the writer knew what she was writing about. You can feel that. You know when you read a book and you say, this writer really knows this. You, you can just feel it. And I, if you could feel it in those stories. Um, and they were full of strong dialogue, full of well-executed scenes. Uh, the difference in writing before she started these stories and afterwards was really dramatic. So what do y'all think happened there? I mean, why do you think, why do you think her story uh, suddenly took off? She wrote what she knew. She wrote what she knew. Probably had more emotional appeal. Yeah. She wrote what she cared about. Right. Right. She wrote what she cared about, had more emotional appeal. It was what she knew. Right. And she had been working on her craft in these lesser stories. She had still been aware of the writerly craft and was working on it. So when finally something that really mattered to her intersected with her learning her craft, then it took her stories to a whole new level. And that's what happened with her. Um, and it was a real pleasure to watch. And I mean, that doesn't happen to me that much, but because um, people usually don't listen to what I say, because I, I don't blame them. Um, <laughs> But in this case, she did, and um, it really was wonderful. Now, there was another writer I had, and we will call her Mary, because she, she, it didn't work out for her. And um, she uh, was this writer, she was really great, I really liked her a lot, but she was writing these experimental stories. Um, and I, I'm, I don't have anything against experimentation in fiction, but, but that's what she called them. They, they just were really bad. Um, and um, it was real disconnected and fragmented, and you couldn't tell what the writer was saying or anything. And in one of our conferences, we were talking, and she said, um, well, why? And, and she said, uh, and then she started talking about her Irish heritage. And then she talked about how she goes to Ireland all the time. And then she told me that she her mother was like Irish. I mean, everybody was Irish. And yet there wasn't, she'd never written about it in anything for me. It was just these uh, experimental stories. Um, and so I said, well, why don't you write about Ireland and your experiences there? And she said, so, uh, I don't know. And um, so she didn't for a long time until she got so many bad grades um, <laughs> that finally, out of desperation, I feel sure, she gave me a story that was set in Ireland about uh, this girl who comes to visit her family in Ireland, her grandparents and everything. And again, it was stunningly good. It was really good. And she wrote about the, the village and, and the family and it wasn't stereotypical sort of Irish, trying to act like Irish, not knowing Irish. She knew this, and you just felt it in the pages. And I thought, all right, she has had a breakthrough. And I made a big deal out of it. Next story I got, guess what? <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Experiment time. And so um, she never went back to the Ireland stuff in my class anyway. And um, I don't know why that is. I still don't know why that is. Um, but so in that case, she, she definitely went there, but she didn't stay there. And um, I have a feeling that she will go there again um, in her work, but she wasn't ready to do it then. And instead, she was writing. It was like. Um, James Joyce, but really bad James Joyce is what she was writing before or something. Like Ulysses, worse than Ulysses or something. <laughs> um, and I don't know why uh, we do that, but we do. Here's one more example of the too painful sort. This guy's name was Dan Rogers. Um, and uh, 
he had served in the army. He uh, was an officer and in Iraq. And um, he's, uh, he teaches uh, high school English, high school history in Asheville now. And he's a really smart, really good guy. And um, so he was writing these stories. He was writing these stories that were like trying to be funny from a, like a drunk old boy's point of view or something. And um, I mean, there are plenty of Southern writers that write about drunk old boys and they do it really well. But <laughs> these, they just felt like imitation drunk old boy stories. And the guy mostly stayed down in the rec room and just drank beer. I mean, that was about it. I mean, what do you think? <laughs> A guy stays down in the rec room and just drinks beer? Is that worthy of your readerly time? <laughs> I don't think so. So um, I kept giving him trouble. And I said, well, so if you served in Iraq, why don't you write about it? And he just, he wouldn't. And I knew that was painful. But again, I don't know how good his grades were, but they were all right but maybe out of desperation, but I don't think so. I think he really wanted to write about it. Finally, finally, he handed in a story. Um, well, one thing I'll tell you about this guy is his comments about um, what we read in class were incredibly insightful. Like he read with great um, um, ability to see what a writer was doing. And that told me that he could do it. You know, if, if I have a student who isn't reading, isn't writing well, and, but who can read with great insight, then that tells me there's still all kinds of possibilities with that person. So, and he was doing that, and so that's why I kept pushing him. Um, and finally, he handed in this story. Um, well, what I had told him, as I said, we need smart guys like you writing about that. You went there, you served, you knew it, you saw it. We need smart guys like you to write, write it. And so he brought back this story. Um, it was very moving, very embodied, harrowing account of an Iraqi family running a checkpoint and getting shot to death. And he had been there. Um, and it was very moving and hard to read in some ways and hard for him to write. But he rose to the challenge and um, to that tension within him. And I saw his wife, his wife is a writer, and she's in another class of mine, and she said that's the first time he's ever written about that. I was so glad to see that. Um, and so this guy rose to the occasion. Um, so those are some examples of like, you know, things are too painful, but you push through it. And part of it is craft, too. Part of it is, getting distance, how to get distance. And if you're writing fiction, that gives you all kinds of options um, to get distance from the material so that painful material becomes less painful and just a story. Um, this came up, uh, y'all talked about this. Maybe we're afraid that if we write about whatever it is, we'll hurt others. Mm -hmm. and this is a really common one. Uh, maybe even cause them pain, maybe great pain or we're worried that we'll embarrass our family. Uh, we're worried we'll offend people. Uh, maybe we're worried that the subject matter is inappropriate, too uncomfortable for people to bear reading. So I had this one student, her name is Paula Kane, and I had her, I, I, I teach this community class and anybody can be in there once they get in it. I take good writers in that class and anytime they're in it, they can stay in it for as long as they want. So I had some people in there for about eight years, nine years, working on novels, memoirs, and things. And people rotate out, and they finish things, and I have new people, but that's what was going on. And Paula had been in my class for about nine years and writing beautiful stories, but there was one story that she really wanted to write that she hadn't yet, and it was about her father had grown up in an institute. It was called like the... It was called the Something School for the Feeble-Minded. I forgot the name of it, in um, Baltimore. And, uh, her, and it was for people with special needs, except her father was not like that. Uh, her father was the son of a guy who was a handyman around the place. But it, but it was so interesting to her as a little girl hearing about it all 
that she had it in her mind that she's going to write about this place. And she wanted to really bad, but she knew that her father would be really upset with her if he, if he knew about it. So I kept bugging her, and I said, well, just write it. You know, just go ahead and write it. She said, no, but, but my father will be very upset. Well, I said, well, don't tell him. <laughs> you know, just don't tell him, just write it. So she started writing it. And um, again, almost immediate, and, and she did a good bit of research around her father. And she started writing it, and there were beautiful pages, beautiful, best stuff she's ever written so far. But somewhere along the line, her father figured out that she was writing about it. And he, he would call her and say, so you're writing about it? She said, yes. And then he would say, well, let me tell you about it. And then they had longer and longer talks. And the more she wrote, the more he told him. And they had this sort of reconnection over her, his history that she had assumed he did not want to go there. But because of the occasion of this writing this, starting this novel, they reconnected and her novel became much stronger and they reconnected. So that was really interesting to me. We think we know how people are going to react, but you just don't know. Um, I had a novel, it's called In the Family Way. Um, and what I do, uh, what I did, um, my father's dead now, but um, uh, what I used to do is I, I never showed my novels to my parents unless I knew it was going to be published. Because why, why worry them, you know? <laughs> and, and you might sort of reassure yourself with this, too, is it's really a vain worry to think about being published because, you know, you're probably not going to be. It's, it's really hard. And so, um, I, so I never showed them anything until it was, like, in uh, galleys. But I did show them in the family way because it was autobiographical to some extent. There's a death in there that didn't happen in my family. But the father, who I characterize as a Waffle House mystic, <laughs> um, because my father was interested in Eastern religion and he went to Denny's a lot. <laughs> and, um, and that character was a lot like my dad. It, it was the most autobiographical character I've ever written, probably. So. Uh, I knew there were, it might not be good, but I wasn't sure. So I gave the book to my parents, and my mother is in there too. I mean, she is my mother. She's not my mother. Um, and she read it, and she said, well, that was really good. And um, then my father read it and, and said, oh, Marguerite, he's writing about me. <laughs> And Mama said, Tom, Tom, it's fiction, it's fiction. And they said, no, it's me. He's writing about me. And so Daddy um, was just, his Alzheimer's was just starting. So he read the book six or seven times to try to absorb it. And then he was really upset. And so I called and I said, Daddy, uh, I'm sorry if I upset you. I'm glad to come and talk to you about the book. And he said, all right, let's do that. So he avoided me for a while. I kept trying to set up meetings. He was asleep all the time. And finally, um, I'm, I came down and met with him. And, and I said, so Daddy, you know, um, we talked a little bit. And I said, so is there something you would like me to change in the book? Because I, I, it was just in galley, so I could change what I wanted. And he said, well, in, in the Waffle House scene, you refer to this trucker as bleary-eyed, and that suggests he's drunk. And he's not drunk. So I want you to change that. I said, that's all? <laughs> that's all you want me to change? He said, yeah. I said, oh, OK. <laughs> and so, and we had uh, some great talks that, again, we never would have had if I hadn't given him that book and hadn't written about him, sort of. And actually, those were some of the last real talks we had before his d dementia became full-blown. 
So, I, you know, I, when people have this fear about what family, family are going to think, first of all, they're probably not going to read it. But if you're lucky and it's published and you want to show it to them, then show it to them and see what happens, you know? And you never know. You never know. Um, so there's that. Um, related to this, but a little different, maybe we're afraid what people will think of us. Maybe we're afraid we'll be the ones embarrassed or disliked or even hated. Um, and we talked about this at dinner. Um, uh, Thomas Wolfe, Look Homeward Angel. Um, do y'all know Thomas Wolfe? He uh, is a writer from my hometown. And um, he wrote a book called Look Homeward Angel, which was a bestseller at the time. And he alienated a lot of people in town because he wrote about them. He wrote about everybody in town. And um, people were really upset. In fact, the library wouldn't even carry a copy of his book. It wasn't until Fitzgerald, um, who was staying there because his wife Zelda was in the hospital there, he bought a book and took it to the library and gave it to him and said, you need to have this in your library. But anyway, um, Wolf, everybody hated him, or that's what he thought. But it wasn't too long before people became upset that they weren't included in the book. <laughs> so again, you know, these, you just need to dismantle these, these preconceptions you have that you've just put in front of whatever it is you want to get to. Uh, because the real issue might not be that little artificial thing of what will people think, all this stuff. It might be, you can't write it. You're not up to writing it. Well, why don't you see? Um, Maybe we think we'll get in some kind of trouble, possibly sued. Um, and I've talked about this a couple of times before, is the, story, the novel used for the Wayne County Read is The Pleasure Was Mine. And um, with that novel, I forgot that, well, there's a, there's a nursing home, and it's not presented in the most complimentary of lights all the way through. And it's called Rolling Hills, which I thought you know, was good because Prate thinks of it as rolling bills. But, but I forgot that in Greenville, which the story set, there's a rolling green. And so I thought, oh, well, that might not be so good. And the book was already out, and I thought, well, maybe they'll try to sue me or something. Um, which, again, is a vain thing. You know, you're thinking somebody's <laughs> going to read your book. Um, and so, but, the, but when they used the book for the Greenville County Read, one of the first things that happened was that, that very nursing home stepped up and said, we want to have you come to our facility and give a presentation and a reading. They even had like aprons that said the pleasure was mine. I mean, it was like, <laughs> oh my God, it was like all out. Um, so again, um, I thought I was going to get in trouble and I didn't. Then there's fear of a different kind, fear of being boring. That was talked about. Uninteresting. Maybe we don't think anyone would be interested in our lives or our worlds or what interests us. Maybe we think what interests us wouldn't interest others. We avoid writing about our interests, even our passions, and write about something else because we're trying to write about what people want to hear, what, they're in, what we think they're interested in. And I see this again and again in student writing. Students often don't see the worth in their own worlds and consequently cut themselves off from their own best source. Um, for instance, let's say you have a passion for dragonflies and you know everything there is to know about dragonflies. And you haven't written about dragonflies because you think nobody else is interested in dragonflies. Well, that's crazy because it's, it, it's going to be fascinating because you're obsessed with it. If you have passions or obsessions, obsessions are even better. If you have things that are, are absolutely paramount to you, then you should be tapping into that somehow. You should be making use of that. And I don't care how weird or bizarre they are, probably the weirder or more bizarre they are, the more interesting they're going to be. But don't feel like you have to be bizarre to write. Um, 
the whole thing about the whole New York City thing I just talked about, that's an example of it where people are setting their stories in New York City because they think that's what people want to hear about. Or you hear this stuff of like, well, what, how will they market it? How will the editor market it? Or, you know, what, how will this, and, and, and that's the wrong place to start. You don't start with like your, like the, the reader's expectations. You start with what matters to you. And you write it out of what matters to you. That is the only way to write really well. You don't try to figure out what people want. You, you write what matters to you, and then you make that accessible to the readers through the execution of your craft. Um, uh, we've tried to write about it, have written about it, but we're not getting it right. Or it feels too depressing or painful to keep working on. We feel so weighed down by it that we just quit working on it. We talked about this at supper too a little bit, and that is um, that if you write regularly, then you're just going to keep trying. And so, if your first attempt to get it didn't work, just keep trying to try different ways. And fiction is really great because it offers so many different possibilities. Um, you can, for instance. If you've been trying to write this story in this one point of view, like maybe a point of view close to your own, but then you inhabit, let's say, your aunt's point of view or a father, your father's point of view. I had this student at UNCA who handed in a story about what was it like her first day at UNCA, a student's first day at UNCA. Um, and it was a fiction story, but it was pretty boring. And I said uh, to her, I said, well, it's OK, but it, it lacks any real tension. And I said, well, why don't you think about trying to write this from, let's say, the girl's mother's point of view of the girl going off to college? And that girl, she just looked at me and she said, well, I'll have to talk to my mother. <laughs> and I said, well, no, you don't have to. Just, just make it up. So, again, I was amazed because usually people don't listen. And <laughs> about three or four weeks later, this girl handed in a story that was incredibly good, full of great tension from the point of view of a mother whose daughter has gone off to college. And it was really, really strong. And that girl actually ended up going on through the creative writing department at UNCA and then recently graduated from an MFA program. And I think one thing that, that told me that what she did was she was listening and she was willing to look at her work in a different way. And that's part of all this criticism stuff is you've got to be open, you've got to be strong enough to be open, but you've also uh, open and yet know yourself. Like know you'll come back to, to whatever is true about what you want to say. But you've got to be open to other possibilities. Because if you're rigid and you don't take other people's insights, then chances are, unless you're brilliant, you're not going to make it. Because it's just too, we can't think, it's hard for us to see our work outside of our, you know, we spend so much time with it. Um, all right. So why don't we take about um, 15 minutes. And what I'd like you to do is write the first scene of what you never have written about or always wanted to write about but were too afraid to ask. <laughs> just write like a scene. Write a beginning. And just see what happens. <laughs> 